I have uh, Professor Howard Schmidt, the president of the ISF here, who is now going to uh, tell us a little bit about some information from his keynote speech uh, a couple of weeks ago about security in the downturn and the threat horizon. Um, so, Howard. Well, one of the things when we start, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, what's going to happen to security? Is security going to, the spend going to go down? Are people going to be, start being laid off in this downturn economy? And I think clearly what people have recognized more so than ever in the past that security actually helps you to protect your resources. So conversations I've had with chief executives, conversations I've had with senior executives and board of directors members are saying is we need to do everything we can to protect the resources we have, protect our financial systems, so as a consequence you don't do that by uh, reducing security or the investment in security. Okay, so if they're not going to reduce the investment in security, um, what are they going to do? Because, you know, statistics say, and in fact, I've had statistics on both sides. Some say that they're increasing right. uh, spending, others saying there's been a, a decrease, and I think people are confused. Well, and I think it depends on who you talk to. When you, when you talk to some, some people that aren't familiar with the budgeting process, I think the initial reaction is when they get an email that says we need to cut back expenses 5%, 10%, I think there's, there's a sort of initial reaction that says, oh, gee, they're cutting the suspending for security. But in some cases, it may be just a deferral for, for the next quarter or maybe two quarters down the road. And these are generally project-related things, hardware purchase that may uh, result in an upgrade that really don't change the posture of security, only improve the way you manage it, for example, or the, the way you can reduce maybe some headcount by using better technologies. So as a consequence, that's what happens. But when you start looking at the executive levels and discussions that people have, they'll say, okay, how can we do the same amount of security? How can we continue to reduce risk, but how can we do that in a more cost-effective manner? As we all know, when, when, when we have a lot of cash, we have a lot of availability of assets and resources in companies, we have a tendency to spend a little bit more money than we actually need to. So now they're coming back and saying, how much security is enough? Are we doing the right thing? Are we spending the money on the right things? Do we need to train people better? Do we need to buy more equipment? Or do we just need to do better monitoring? Those are the discussions that are taking place. And as a consequence, there's a confusion a little bit about whether we're spending more, spending less, or spending the same level. Right. And uh, having met all the, the CISOs that you have done and had these discussions, have you got any conclusions? Are there top three or top five? Or I do. As a matter of fact, last week I spent uh, uh, all of last money with the Executive Security Action Forum, part of the RSA conference in the U.S., and virtually every security professional I talked to at the C-level were all saying the same thing, that they can't afford to uh, cut back on security. So their remit is do it, do it well, but do it as cheaply as possible until we get by these things. Never did I hear one of them say, we've got to cut the budget back. They're saying is we've got to do it as good as we can and try to save money the best way we can. Okay, so, so um, how do we do that? Okay. Well, there's a couple ways. One, you look at what you're spending the money on. When you start looking at uh, you know, protecting, for example, a $10,000 asset, uh, but you're spending $50,000 to protect it. That doesn't make much sense. There's better ways to do it. In some cases, without investing in newer technology, you can put more controls, better auditing on things. Uh, having automated tools in there, looking at anomalies in the way the things that are taking place. Looking at issues about vulnerability management. In the ISF group, of course, we look at the power of almost 300 companies working together and deciding, okay, here's, what the, here's how this company's doing it. Without another company having to go out and do all the research to learn how to do that same thing, they share that information amongst themselves so you don't have that learning curve to get, all, get up and running on some of the security things. Also looking at some of the vendor relationships. Across the board, when you start looking at the financial impact, the vendors are in the same boat. They still need to sell their products. They still need to meet the needs of their venture capitalists and their investors. So as a consequence, there's a better discussion to be have had with them relative to how good can I negotiate a deal to be able to get the security I need but not spend as much money. All right, okay. Um, and what about the threat horizon aspect of your talk? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure, and that's trying to take the lessons we've learned in the past not take them in isolation and say, okay, how can we build the next generation of systems that take into account 
all the great richness and robustness of the applications that we use today without some of the baggage of some of the security vulnerabilities we've had. Some of the things that basically look at authentication, authorization, uh, uh, delegation of administrative privileges across an IT system from, from a uh, uh, configuration perspective. How can we make sure we build the things in the, in the future? The other thing is, is not living totally in the past, but also when we start building these things out, what are the things that we're looking at that may be thrown at us next? You know, we know an awful lot about malware and spyware and attacks on applications through vulnerability. So what are the next generation things? Attack on mobile systems, uh, attack on, uh, you know, wireless systems, for example. So when we look at the threat horizon, figure out how we can do some really great things with those, but also anticipate how the bad guys can break those things and take advantage of us and make sure that as we're building those systems, we don't give them the opportunity to do that. You know, some, some people would say the only way we can evolve our security system is to scrap what we had in the past. Um, and, I, you know, because if we keep trying to evolve it, we've still got, you know, some of the, the aspects that you mentioned earlier that were okay for their time, but today they just build weakness into our system. Um, what's your perspective on, on that for handling the new threats? Well, there, there's a couple things. First, we, it's going to be a long time before we can get away from the legacy systems that basically have been built in an environment where the threat, where the threat matrix was not as difficult as it is today. So as a consequence, no matter, even if we had the desire to scrap everything and start from scratch again, there's just no way practically we can do that now because of the legacy equipment. But what we can do is look at some of the technologies that basically give us greater enhancements. For example, deployment of IPv6, uh, things such as DNSSEC, uh, secure BGP, things that are currently available now that can basically dramatically change the way we're doing the technology and give us more security without giving up the things that, we, that we've uh, come to enjoy in the past. So, you, you know, the old story about you can't fill the baby out with the bathwater. It would really be a dramatic uh, negative impact if we tried to scrap everything, but what we can do is slowly but surely replace things with things that are more secure, that are designed for a high threat environment, but also remain very easy to use and also give us the same capabilities we've got today. That's good engineering and designing of the next generation of, of internet systems that we use. Right, and you know, I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, all oh, this is so easy to talk about. <laughs> right. But the practice, yeah. the actual... It, it is, and, and that's, and, and you know, it's like everything else, the devil's in the details. Yeah. How do we move forward on this? And we can't move across the board unilaterally. And that's where, you know, for example, when we created the National Strategy to Secure Cyberspace at the White House, Every time I get finished giving a speech, every time I talk about that, I'd always close by saying, we all have to do our part to secure our part of cyberspace. So, so if I update my system, make it IPv6 enabled, DNSSEC, IPsec, use these sort of technologies, I do it, you do it, this person does it over here, increasingly the ability to have the, the, the infrastructure become more secure becomes a reality. And, and so when you start thinking about it, it's a relatively short path to get there. We just have to make sure we make the business decision to move there and start building out the plans to do it. The thing that I think is really counterproductive is when we throw up our hands and says, oh, we can never fix this. It can never get better. You've got to start now, and you've got to start making those plans for tomorrow, next quarter, and next year that we will be more secure because we know how to do it. Sure. All right, well, um, Howard, thank you very much for your time. Indeed, my pleasure. Good to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Ben Chai. I'm the editor for securityvibes.com. If you've enjoyed this video or have any other comments to make, please do fill in the comment boxes and let us know what you think. Thank you.